Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. And welcome to season two of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. I think we've been going since January, but I like the idea of 25 episodes in the first season and 25 episodes in the second season. And then when we get to episode 100, we'll have a huge party or something. I don't know what we'll do, but this is season two, episode one, but it's also our 26th episode. So welcome. And tonight we are going to talk about something that I think each of us have had experience with, and that is crisis intervention teams and the police and just uh, guys, I haven't seen you in a while. So <laughs> welcome back. Let's just do a quick one minute update how how everybody is with their families and their sons. Um, Mimi, why don't you go first? Well, things are going along well. Everybody is on a pretty even keel. Nothing major one way or the other, which I always take as a win. Um, Nick's doing very well with his exercise and diet i mean he's down like 50 pounds from before he went on oh wow so this is huge and he actually said to me the other day he says you know i feel better i feel better about myself and i feel better like i don't feel like a big bloated person and i mean just that self-awareness is a huge thing so that seems to be going well we're still knee deep in the dental work which i don't know if we're ever going to get fixed Um, I had him, I was waiting, waiting patiently for this dental school to process his application so that we could afford these numerous root canals he needs. And um, just found out today that they put it in the wrong box or something. So we're back to square one with that. Oh, for Pete's sake. So these things are just, but you all know those frustrations. So that kind of stuff, but all in all, everything's fine. Happy to see you guys again. That's great. I I posted something on Facebook this week just to give people hope because we also are are in a, a good period. So we're grateful for every minute. If you're new to our podcast, I guess we should explain. We are three moms who are also authors and activists. We each have relatively grown sons with schizophrenia, each in sort of a different phase of recovery. And we're here to share that information and give hope and By the way, celebrating 10,000 downloads of our podcast. Yay, 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 yay. I don't have any here. Here's a wine fork. I'll just show it. So congratulations. Here's my coffee. (laughs) Here's water. (laughs) Water. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. And we're on YouTube. We've got uh, 157 subscribers. So more people are listening than watching on YouTube, but we're there in both places You found us, so you know where to find us. Subscribe, share, we're so happy. We are in a place at the moment, this is 14 months after my son's breakdown, which resulted in his ninth hospitalization, five and a half months in the hospital. And at the moment, we're having a good, we're having a good day. And that's as far as I ever get. But Sunday is family visit day and he used to have a, a, a number of what I would call superstitions, what he would probably call beliefs that he never shared, but little miracle things happened. Like he allowed his sister to cook for him. Like he would always go, no, thank you. And we never know what's underneath those things. Mm-hmm. His, his nieces and nephew adore him. I got video of him playing with them. And honestly, a year ago, I thought that was never going to happen. So I'm happy about that. It's a, it's a hopeful, it's a hopeful day. Mindy. I saw that picture of your son and your your grandchild or niece or whoever. And I sent it in an email, right? Oh my gosh. The smiles on their faces were so wonderful. It just made me practically cry. I was so happy for you. (laughs) Um, for us, um, Jim has had two medical problems in the last couple of weeks. He was in the hospital for three weeks or three weeks, three days with cellulitis. And, you know, most people say, oh my gosh, that's really painful. That's life threatening, et cetera, et cetera. But we Grylings were celebrating. It was a small problem for us, you know, that compared to being in the psych ward where no one will talk to you. And would you believe 
No one signed a single release or asked us to. And the doctor called me, we communicated, we could learn all about Jim's uh, cellulitis and nobody mentioned, read the word of a medical release of information. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Yeah. He also yeah. had a big hunk. Exactly. He also had a big hunk of his um, stomach uh, cut out this week, a, a piece that was about two inches square or cubed. And that was because he has a continuing problem with a pucker in his stomach and a sore that won't heal. So they removed it and they're checking it for cancer. Um, but that was nothing he didn't even, it was outpatient. So physical problems where you can communicate with doctors and everybody else, eh, that's nothing for any of us to work. It's a, it's a world of difference. So that's where we are at the moment. And if you're just starting on your journey with a, a child or a spouse or a parent or a sibling with schizophrenia, and you haven't reached a hopeful stage yet, we, we hope that you will. And that's why this podcast exists. So I will share that when my son had his last breakdown, the way my local police department handled him caused us to write a thank you letter wow. to everybody in the precinct. They could not have been better. And I would attribute that to good training. And they had empathy. They were endlessly patient with him. And every time that has happened in our numerous breakdowns, I have thanked my lucky stars for crisis intervention team training. I believe that our local police has had it, have been trained in some way. And so I thought we would explore that tonight. Uh, you know, police activity is very much in the news these days and response to mental health crises is often left in their hands where right now it is the police. They're the frontline responders. And each of us has had experience with police officers trained in crisis and Maybe that's why our sons are alive and not incarcerated today. So I'm going to bring on our guest uh, in a moment. Her name is Amy Watson. She is a professor at the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She's also president of CI CIT International, CIT standing for Crisis Intervention Team. Amy Watson, come on in, join us. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're just thrilled to have you. I had the pleasure of speaking at CIT International about, I want to say about four or five years ago, back when we met in person and shared a bit of our experience. And I will also share with you that I was attending a LEAP training uh, with Dr. Amador, LEAP uh, being a process for communicating with your loved one. And we had CIT trained police officers in our group. And they okay. shared with me that they wanted to know even more because it was so helpful, but that other members of their police force called them the touchy feely guys and weren't always that supportive. So we'll, we'll get into that. I want to start by asking you, uh, Two things, really. I want to know your story, why you personally do this work, and then maybe you can just morph into what is the CIT program model? Sure. So um, I guess why I'm drawn to this work is complicated to some extent, but I do identify as someone with lived experience of mental illness, um, had significant um, difficulties, particularly as a young person. Um, although my pathway has been extremely privileged um, in terms of access to resources, good care. Um, and so that's something that I brought, you know, kind of forward as I started my professional career. And I was initially out of college. I was a probation officer um, for about seven years, serving on a team that specialized um, in uh, working with probation clients with serious mental illness. Um, and there, I mean, one of the things that I felt that I brought to that work was, um, and I didn't fully recognize my own lived experience in it, but that one thing I could offer to people, even though service systems were fragmented and they had a lot of challenges, I could treat people like human beings. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that oftentimes, particularly 
people with serious mental illness going through the criminal legal system don't get much of, um, which is really unfortunate. Um, but I also, what I, what I saw there is I had a lot of clients, often young male clients who were early in their illness that had repeated contacts with police and not necessarily because they were involved in anything criminal, but somehow because of the contact, they ended up with a disorderly conduct, uh, obstructing justice, uh, a battery to a police officer um, charge. And this was a repeated cycle, then court dates were missed, warrants were issued, and it kept going. And that's really where I got interested in this intersection and went back to graduate school and I started doing research on police encounters with people with serious mental illness. Um, and Chicago, I was in Chicago at the time and they were starting to look at implementing CIT. So I was part of that process and got some opportunities to get involved in CIT, but also to do research on CIT. Um, that's really the work I've been doing for almost two decades now. Wow. So, so what is the program model? If you could sort of sum it up and then we have more questions, but. Sure. So the, the model, most people are know of the CIT training, um, which is a 40 hour training. Um, according to the model, it's for officers that self-select into the training. So that they may be particularly have um, interested in developing their skills for responding to mental health crisis calls. Um, the training involves going through, you know, signs and symptoms, different medications, um, de-escalation skills. Um, there's a lot of time spent on talking to family members, people with lived experience and, and developing empathy through just that interaction with people and getting a better understanding. A lot of time spent learning the local community resources so that officers know how to, how to connect people to care. And then they also do a fair amount of scenario-based practice of the skills that they're learning. Um, so it, it's a really packed week with a lot of information and a lot of opportunity to interact um, with people and to practice skills. So that, that's a, a piece of the model. Um, but the larger sort of foundation of the model really is uh, collaborative partnerships between law enforcement, uh, mental health service providers, advocates, family members, and people with lived experience. Um, that really work together. They look at the services available in the community and identify gaps and opportunities to build that system, um, you know, and hopefully so that there's more access for people before they go into crisis, um, but also that the system's able to respond when there is a crisis. And if officers are part of that response, that they're well prepared to do that safely and effectively. Um, so really, the training by itself is important, but it really has to be supported by those partnerships. Uh, that's really, really where you see the most effect. Wow. Mimi, you want to share anything about your experience with police or? You know, yeah, you know, I am. Um, the one story that I tell often was um, the scariest one. And uh, Nick had been having it turned out he had taken some street drugs and he was in very bad psychosis and he happened to be at the office of the place that does his in-home care so she called me and said something's really wrong with him and I said please don't do anything till I get there and I'm 40 minutes away but I'm so afraid of anybody calling the police because of all the stories that we've all heard. And so I, um, I drove madly there. And as soon as I got there, I could see he was in real bad shape. So we called and this is before, this is after I lived in LA. This is up here in Washington where I live in a small town. So I was even more afraid because I knew in LA, at least the policemen by and large had the CIT training that had been my experience. And so the ambulance, the police arrived first. And, you know, he comes out with his gun and he's, you know, coming up to Nick and I'm terrified what's going to happen. And I tried to take him aside and tell him what the circumstances were and that Nick has schizophrenia and that he's clearly psychotic, but he's never been violent and he's not a threat. And I didn't get two, three words into it till the policeman said to me, tell it to the to paramedics, don't tell it to me. And I said to him, well, 
you're the guy with the gun. So I'm going to tell it to you. And I'm also going to stand between you and my son. And he wasn't real pleased with that and um, didn't really talk to me anymore and was kind of hostile. And when the paramedics came, I mean, it was, it devolved and it was really bad. But what strikes me about that experience is not only the indication of how we have to be in fear of the police who are there supposed to help us, but also that I am, you know, a middle-class white woman in America. So I could say to him, well, I'm gonna put myself between you and my son because I knew damn well he wasn't gonna shoot me. If I'd been black or brown, I think it would have been a different story. And uh, I know it could have been a different story. And we see those stories on the news all the time. So to me, it's an indicator of how flawed the system is in terms of police response, but also how much worse it is for people of color and that it's time to just acknowledge that and started correcting it because it's really bad. Okay, so and, and that will morph us into another area. It's definitely worth talking about. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll leave that statement as it is because it, it's true. It's absolutely true. So if so I have a question my, then too. My question yeah. is, what does the research tell us about CIT? So there's a pretty good body of research now. And so I would say CIT is evidence-based for improving officers knowledge, their attitudes, their self-efficacy for responding to mental health crisis and their endorsement of de-escalation skills. We also have pretty strong evidence that CIT um, increases um, linkages to care. So um, in communities that have CIT programs and CIT trained officers, officers are doing more to when they respond to get people linked to care, be it a transport, be it um, accessing a mobile crisis team or some other type of linkage. Um, the studies that some of them I've done and that my colleagues have done have found that CIT trained officers are more likely to make an effort to make those linkages for people. Um, the, the data on arrests and use of force are a little murkier, partially because they're relatively low frequency events um, statistically. Um, unfortunately, you know, when they happen, they seem very big, um, but it, it's a little bit harder to kind of identify if we're having a significant effect. But there are some studies that have found reductions in arrest, um, you know, following CIT implementation. And one of the studies I did in Chicago, we found that CIT officers were less likely to use force with more resistant um, people that were experiencing crisis. So we have some signals on arrest and use of force, but we just don't have as much evidence at this point um, on, on those two outcomes. And I will say, um, welcome to, as a neighboring state, I'm from Minnesota, and even okay. though the international president, I know you're in Wisconsin, and so yes. Packers, my husband would say, because he's from Green Bay, heading to the Packer game this weekend. So <laughs> um, I'm so, so glad you're here. And so my personal stories, before I get to my question, I actually have three short ones. One, I'm interested that you said use of force you think is less based on the research that you do have with CIT trained officers. And the only time our son has ever had force used against him was before our local police had training. And at that time, um, you know, they tackled him, hogtied him down to the stretcher in the ambulance and shrieked at me to stay back, stay back, stay back, you know, to the point where I was uh, registered a complaint with our police chief afterwards and our mayor and then you know, it wasn't too long after that, that now the police officers in my local community do get training. They don't get um, CIT training necessarily because in Minnesota, our law says 16 hours of training versus the 40, I think it is for official gold standard CIT training. So I'd be interested in your comment on that. But the next episode, um, I think might be a demonstration of why maybe 16 hours isn't enough. 
because um, uh, we were at our wits end with our son. And by the way, every time we call the police, his illicit drug use is always involved. And we take our hearts in our throat as well, because like Mimi said, even though I'm middle class and white, we still fear there are plenty of examples of people with mental illness of all colors being shot. It's definitely heightened with people of color. And as I'm well aware of being from Minnesota where George Floyd was murdered. But um, so this time the officers have had training and we were at our wits end because um, I'd called the crisis intervention team and they, once they heard the situation over the phone, said they couldn't come out. It wasn't, he wasn't dangerous enough to himself or others. Um, then I, and I, his regular mental health workers said they could do nothing because he has his own choice to make about the lifestyle he's living. And, but both of the two advised me to call the police if, he, if things should escalate. And so I described the situation. They said, yes, call the police. What the situation was, was he was, he and I were sitting in a coffee shop, but because he was using drugs and he had breakthrough symptoms, he was paranoid about other patrons in the coffee shop. So he thought they were saying bad things about him. They were trashing him. So he was turning to each one as they said something bad about him and was spitting in their direction. He wasn't doing it uh, very forcefully. So I don't think anybody knew he was doing that, but I could tell he was doing that. So I, and I couldn't get him out of the coffee shop. And I thought if one person looks at him or says a thing out loud that I could hear, it could escalate. So I called the police as everybody recommended that I do. And these trained police came out and said, they, they were very good about de-escalating. They pulled Jim aside and said, you know, what is your diagnosis, sir? And um, he said, schizoaffective disorder. And then the police officer turned to me and said, oh, well, with that diagnosis, you know, hearing voices and reacting to them um, is, that's, that's how he, he is all the time, ma'am. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we are just going to leave you with him. And um, so that was a time when I thought a little bit of training wasn't enough because here I am, the mother saying, my son is very sick. Everybody that works with him in the mental health world knows he's sick. They're telling me to do something, to call you. But they just thought, the police officer responding thought that Jim was always that way because of his diagnosis. You know, and he's not, he would not normally be spitting on people or being paranoid uh, in the coffee shop. But they left me then with him. Um, and then the last time, I just want to mention briefly a positive encounter. <laughs> we, um, Jim was very out of control in our house and I called the police and they, I think, could have easily taken him to jail or I wanted them to take him to the hospital. But they so succeeded in de-escalating the situation skillfully and wonderfully that Jim totally calmed down and they separated him from me and took him back home again. And, um, and, he, and then nothing came of it. Well, we had more episodes because he continued to use drugs and he wasn't doing well. But that time, um, everything was smooth as glass when they left. So those are my three examples. And I would like you to comment on the 16 hours versus the 40. But also my questions are, um, what is the magnitude of the need or trained officers? And what are some of the specific goals or ends that, that you have seen um, by having officers trained? Sure, so I'll start a little bit um, addressing the question about 16 hours. Um, and, and a little bit by going back to the original Memphis CIT model was really designed so that it wasn't necessarily the 40 hour training for all officers. The idea was to identify officers that would be particularly good at responding to mental health calls that had an interest in being CIT officers and they would go through the training. And then when mental health related calls were identified that those officers would be dispatched or you know, if another officer could request them. So you had these officers that became specialists and it wasn't just an officer that sat through a 40 hour training. It was an officer that this was part became part of their professional identity. 
um, that doesn't mean that all officers don't need some training. Um, so, um, you know, there's very, they need some training in their pre-service academy. Um, they need in-service training on a regular basis that covers de-escalation and some mental health components as well. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say whether 16 hours is enough. It certainly wouldn't be enough if it's just a one-shot deal. Um, it's, it's something that needs to be reinforced. And we're starting to see more states put in requirements for, um, you know, a certain number of in-service hours devoted to mental health crisis response every three years. Um, so, so people are starting to get the idea that it needs to be offered multiple times. Um, so I, I think that's important. The other thing is, you know, if you have the officers that take on this kind of specialist role, they become champions in, in their agency. And you start to see a shift in the culture of the agency in terms of how they look at um, how they should be responding to mental health related calls and kind of what the norm should be. Um, and, and, and that can be a really important piece too. So maybe not every officer is a CIT officer, but they have an idea of that this is actually something that, you know, it, it's valuable, it's an expectation um, that I provide a good response. And if I identify a mental health related call and can access a CIT officer to assist with it, that's what I should do. So, so that's, an important piece of the model that that you know many times people just think we'll just throw all the officers in the 40 hours. But that doesn't necessarily get the outcome that you want because not all of those officers will fully engage in the content. Thank you. And Minnesota does have every three years um, certain trainings that have to be repeated. So we're one of those states. So excellent. And then and it, the goals or the need, the magnitude of the need. I think the magnitude of the need is really, I mean, it's pretty substantial. Um, we know that police agencies are being called on to respond to, to behavioral health crises um, at an increasing rate. Um, and particularly, um, it's more rapidly increasing um, with the pandemic. Um, we have uh, a shortage of mental health service providers or they're at capacity or over capacity. Um, and we also have people that have stresses that they haven't dealt with before. Um, so we've really seen increases there and, and police agencies that I've talked to have said that, yeah, we're really seeing an uptick in the number of mental health calls. Um, and while it's certainly, I mean, it's the, the estimates of what percentage of the calls for service that they respond to vary because um, we don't have good data on it. Um, but it's known that it's something that takes up significant time. And it's also these are situations that have a great potential, potential to be productive interactions that actually help people and help families or to be really destructive interventions. So I, I think that's an important piece to recognize as well. And the goals of CIT are really um, to, to use those partnerships across agencies and stakeholders to do a couple of things. One is to really prepare a, set, a, a cohort of officers to provide effective, compassionate response when it's needed, but it's also to work together across stakeholders to build those systems that are more responsive, um, you know, so that you can get mobile crisis um, out there, even if you're not, you haven't already assessed that the person's a danger to self or others, because crisis starts before you reach that point. So to, to be able to access assistance earlier in a crisis um, and not having to wait until you're finally at the point where, you know, okay, I'll call police because I don't know what else to do. I bet the officers sometimes get frustrated as families do when there, is, there aren't enough services to hook people up to. When you're intervening in a crisis and then you want to help, you want to hand off to somebody who's a mental health trained person. And then when there's such a long waiting list at times, it must be frustrating for officers like it is for families. Yeah. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of officers that talk about that because, you know, they really want to be able to provide an effective response. Um, and they go to home from work feeling more satisfied with their work if they really have been able to use tools and help people. Um, and, and they're really frustrated. I mean, I know 
talk to officers that say, you know, we can get somebody to the emergency room or, or to a crisis triage center, but sometimes we see them walking out the door before we leave the parking lot without any effective linkage to care. Um, and so they are frustrated. Yeah, yeah. Join, join the club. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, we have spoken a lot in our previous episodes about the continuum of care and what happens after release from the hospital. Mm-hmm. And this is like continuum of care and teamwork before hospitalization or right. before the crisis. And uh, it is so important. So a few rapid fire questions, because I'm just mm-hmm. curious, is uh, CIT in every state? Um, I believe there are CIT programs in every state. Um, you know, we have estimates that there's probably around 3,000 CIT programs uh, okay. across the country and a few outside of the U.S., um, but it's hard to put a, an exact number on it. But yes, okay. there, are, are, there are CIT programs, I think, in every state at this point. So that's great. So what, I am the uh, chief of police in my town, let's say, what's this going to cost me? Who pays for it? Why, you know, why should I send my off? Well, I know why I should. What would stand in the way of me sending all my officers for this training financially? Um, So a police chief might be looking at what does it cost? And oftentimes when communities start a CIT program, um, you have this group that comes together. It's you have mental health providers, law enforcement, uh, oftentimes local NAMI groups or other advocacy groups. Um, Sometimes you have peer provider organizations that come together to develop and implement the training. And oftentimes there's a lot of in-kind work that's going on. So, um, you know, you may have clinicians that do some of the training um, that are just covered by their agency. It doesn't cost the police agency anything. Um, So you may have agencies that are willing to make space available to do the training as well. Um, But so then your main cost really is the officer time um, and, and basically backfill for the, the time that they're off the street. So that, that oftentimes is a cost. And, and what we've seen, some states you have funding for CIT programs that come through their uh, Department of Health Services. Some um, in, in Illinois, where I lived most of my life, um, the funding comes through the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board that funds some of the training. Um, you also may have some local funding. Um, I've seen asset forfeiture money um, being used to fund some of the training. But the, the typical costs are, are space, um, minimal materials. Um, sometimes there's honoraria for the, the content experts that come in and provide some of the training. Um, and then there's the, the officer time um, to do that. In an established CIT program, there's usually at least one person who is a, the program coordinator. Oftentimes there's multiple coordinators. Um, you have a law enforcement one, an advocacy and a mental health one. And so that could be a position that's paid just to have that role. Or it could be that you have people that that's part of their, their job at whatever agency they're from that do that. So as a program gets more established, that coordination piece can be really important. So, so that's a cost. It may be an in-kind cost or a specific cost to the program. A lot of coordinating. So, so, and I imagine some police, I got to do a ride through, a ride along once with a police officer who was CIT trained. And we actually went to a family the day after the crisis to make mm-hmm. sure that they had resources. And I was like, you do this? Cause that never happened to me. That has never happened to me. Right. There's never been any. So I don't, you know, I don't know if it's trickle down training like they send three officers and they come and share with the guy. I don't know, but on the flip side what would you say? And I guess there's no easy answer to this. So maybe just a couple of sentences. What would, what's the cost of not getting this kind of training or not having this team in place? Um, I think there's there's multiple costs. I mean, one is just bad outcomes of mental health crisis encounters that have, you know, significant costs to communities. I mean, it impacts the the person who's in crisis. They you know may end up arrested when a, a connection to services might be a much more effective approach for everybody. Um, you may have someone who, um, or just not connected to anything. You could have uses of force. Um, 
and injuries and lawsuits. So there's cost to those police agencies as well. Um, but then just the cost of having bad encounters um, for the police agency, encounters that are experienced negatively by the community um, don't help them with their relationship with the community or their legitimacy in the community. So anything that police agencies, when they can do things that can really improve their response um, and help them be more effective, that, I mean, th that has a currency for legitimacy, which is really important to policing right now. Um, you know, with all of the tensions and all of the concerns across the country, um, having taking steps to make sure that the providing is effective a response to people um, is really important. Um, so, you know, some chiefs will see it as um, protection from liability and lawsuits, which it, it can be, um, but other chiefs really see it as a way of improving their agency's ability to provide service to the, to the community. And I think it's really important there. Um, the other costs are, I mean, I think officers that feel like they don't have the tools to do their job effectively will experience more burnout um, and more dissatisfaction with the job. So implementing programs that help them do their job better um, actually you know, can have an important impact there as well. Thank you. Mimi. Oh, you're, mu you're muted. Happens once every Zoom call. <laughs> I'm curious. What do the officers say who have had the training? Like, do they get pushback from other officers? Um, Randy said something about, they said, oh, you're the touchy-feely guy. Touchy-feely guys. Yeah. Um, well, when I've talked to officers that have had the training, typically what they tell me is the best training I've ever had since I've been on the force. Uh, I had one officer tell me it's the only training I've ever stayed awake for the entire training. <laughs> or, um, and, and they'll tell you the parts that you like, I talked to officers that, you know, maybe did the training five years ago. And what they remember is the people that come and share their lived experience and the family members. That's what really makes it gel for them. Um, and I have, I mean, I've heard officers talk about how, you know, they get a little bit of razzing from other officers that, you know, they're in the hug a thug program or something like that. But I've also heard you know, I, I've done ride alongs with non CIT officers and they'll say, oh, they're really happy that the, the agency has a CIT program. I had an officer tell me, he's like, you know, if I get to a call and it turns out it's a mental health crisis, I can call a CIT officer to come and assist me in managing it. And that was something that he felt was really useful and helped him do his job better. So I, I think you'd have different reactions. And um, I think over time as, you know, uh, it, CIT programs can help change agency cultures. You see less of the razzing and more of the appreciation of there's this resource that I can utilize too when I'm doing my job. Um, and I, I think it's more appreciated. So we are all very fierce advocates, mothers and advocates to improve the mental health system, Mimi and Randy and I, and we've exhibited that in some of our earlier programs. Um, I mentioned that I talked to our chief in my local city, and later we got officers trained. I have a walking partner who's on the city council in a neighboring city, and I constantly talk to her about all the things going on with our son, including encounters with the police and so forth. In fact, she's in my book that I wrote, Fix What You Can, as one of my good friends, um, but she's also on the city council in a city of Maplewood here in Minnesota, and they have um, trained officers. They also have a couple of social workers that go out at different times with officers. They have involved their fire department. So for those kind of visits that you mentioned that we all think would be utopia and have never experienced, the kind where they come later and check on people and they're proactive the firefighters and the police officers do that in this city. So that is like incredible. And I feel like um, I, by sharing my story every Friday with this walking friend of mine, um, have helped that other city. I wish I was walking with a council member from my city. But our listeners for this program are often starting out new in the mental health world and they have young um, family members who are just starting with schizophrenia. So with all your experience, 
internationally and around the country. Could you give us um, some steps that the average family could take to advocate with their city to get CIT training for their police officers? Um, absolutely. And I think actually family members are the most effective advocates here. Um, and so I think some of it is, is you know, making contact with somebody at your, your police agency. Um, and as a, a member of the community, you can request those, those meetings with, you know, if it's not the chief, um, somebody higher up and to sit down and tell your story. Um, also connecting with other families uh, and going together um, so that um, you know, there's the strength in numbers in doing that. Um, if I've talked to people that have said, you know, I've tried reaching out to the, the, my police department repeatedly and haven't had much luck. So it could also be useful to start connecting with um, mental health providers in the commu community. Um, Cause there may be some people, you know, at your county mental health agency that could become champions for you that might have some ability to make inroads with the police department. Um, with other partners. So it is really working those relationships, but as a family member in a community, I mean, one, as a member of the community, you have the right to talk to the people that are making decisions, um, but also as a family member, you have the ability to really bring in a powerful story. Um, so I think, you know, but starting there and starting to, to, to work and talk to people, develop relationships and, and networking until you can get to the people that can kind of get you in is, I mean, that's what I've seen so many different places as, as where things have started and really starting to build a group of people that will work together on it. Because, I mean, so many families um, have fam include members that struggle with mental health issues. So it's not like you have to look that hard to find other people that you can share some experience with. And so really working those, the, those relationships and building that group and, 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 and kind of networking and then figuring out those kind of levers where you can get in, in front of the people that can make the decisions. Thank you for those. I think those are absolutely wise words. And one, one thing I did in my community, I co-chaired a, a committee through the League of Women Voters where we studied the police. And we actually had the George Floyd murder in Minneapolis, but we had Philandro Castile who was also murdered just during a regular traffic stop by an officer who panicked and, and shot him. And um, that was really tragic too. That was one of our cities and our League of Women Voters study came out actually two weeks before Philandro Castile was killed. So we had just been to that very um, city council with our report and we were asking for more training, more data for you know, how many traffic stops and what color were the people that were stopped and what were the results. And so all, most police um, departments in this area collect data. And then because they're collecting data, the ones that have been the best at it, they've been getting grants from the county for social workers to go out with the police. And that's my last question for you is, do you, does your organization have any position on social workers going out with the police. NAMI Minnesota, National Alliance on Mental Illness, um, isn't a great fan of that because they think that this police should be hooking people up with other services. Um, as a family member, and I'm president of my local NAMI affiliate, I actually like the idea of a police officers being accompanied by social workers. So does your organization have any official position and what's your personal uh, position? So we have recently, we put out kind of a statement kind of explaining why um, we are not a fan of embedded co-response. Um, and that would be putting the social worker in the police car. We do think there's great value in co-response. There are situations where having both a clinician and an officer at the scene can be useful. Um, but our concern about embedding the social worker in the police car is that means that the social worker is not able to ever respond without the officer. So in order to get the social worker, you, you always get the officer. And what we've seen in some programs that do this, the social worker will start looking tactical. Um, so 
I have some pictures that people have sent me that are, you can't tell who's the police officer and who's the social worker. And that social worker, their clinical interaction ends up being dictated by the police agency's policies and procedures because that's what they're working with. So CIT International, um, what we really promote and encourage communities to do is that certainly develop those partnerships so that they can co-respond when needed, um, but also really work to develop independent responses that don't require police unless there's a specific reason that a police officer needs to be there and then you have to have those relationships. So when both show up on scene, they can work together to provide a good response. So, so that's where our position is. Um, not, I mean, certainly many communities are, you know, putting a social worker in a police car and finding it useful. Um, we'd like to see that more as a step towards developing more and more on the side that doesn't always require police, but, but engages police when it's necessary and has the ability to effectively partner. That is an incredible distinction that I did not know before. So that's my learning for the night. I always learn something myself on this program. So thank you very much, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Mimi, you had one more thing to add. We are yeah, just in our final moments. Okay. There um I don't know if if um you're aware of this, Amy, but there's a HBO documentary called uh, Ernie and Joe Crisis Cops. Mm -hmm. And there it's it's pretty accessible. We'll just go online and it's two, it's a CIT program in San Antonio, and it's just such a wonderful um depiction of this and it's something that I think people who don't know a lot about it should watch because it, it I think it'll open a lot of eyes. Yeah, it does a really nice job sort of humanizing the officers and, and showing just, I mean, they really are working hard to provide a good response as well as showing the importance of making sure we have officers that are prepared yeah. to respond. Yeah. Thank you. And, and is it true, because we're getting to our final words, but if a family member is calling the police in, I would imagine it is helpful to give information on the phone that might be helpful. Like my son has a diagnosis of such, like let them know the diagnosis, let them know he's not violent because you don't know if the officer you're getting has is part of crisis intervention team or not. You can ask, can they ask for a CIT member? or just whoever comes, comes. I mean, just give them information so that they don't come in there with their, like what Mimi had with their guns out. Right. Family member, is there any other tips you can give what the family member can tell the police to help them assess the situation accurately before they walk in? Sure, and you know, certainly having sort of a, a crisis plan and um, kind of having the information that you'd wanna provide to your the call taker um, about, you know, that would be important. And, and certainly it depends on where you are. Um, you know, I know in Chicago, I was part of projects where we were trying to get information out to the community saying that if it is a mental health crisis and you're calling 911, ask for a CIT officer. Um, it's kind of a shortcut to the call taker actually identifying this is a CIT call because you can specifically ask for it. And like in Portland, Oregon, if a caller specifically asks for um, it's an ECIT officer there. That's one of the criteria for dispatching them, you know, just that in, in itself. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of knowing what's available in your community, um, but certainly asking if that's available um, and, and providing information um, that can be really useful. And also having family members a little bit educated too on what to expect when police arrive. Um, you know, kind of what some, are some of the things that police do that they have to do for safety um, can be useful as well. And, you know, and hopefully, I mean, you know, luckily, you know, if officers have been through a good CIT program, they've had some opportunity to talk to family members too and have some understanding of what the experience is for a family member in that moment and some compassion for it. Because um, I think oftentimes family members are sort of forgotten in terms of needing support as well, because it's not just a crisis for the person that's being called on, it's a crisis for the entire family. Um, we definitely here, here. know that. <laughs> here, here, and you know, it, if you need book recommendations for these trainings, you've got <laughs> Fix What You Can, he came in with it, been behind his voices. 
Lastly, Amy, where can people get in touch with you for more information? I know there's a there's a, a video on your website. Tell us where they can go to learn more. Sure. So at citinternational.org, um, that's our website, and we have some information there. There's a brief video about CIT. Um, we also have a CIT best practice implementation guide that can be downloaded for free. You can also order a hard copy, but that's not free because um, it costs us <laughs> something. But, but there, that really goes through a lot of information about CIT. So that's pretty accessible. Um, we also have a number of different programs as well. So our website has a lot of information. Um, you can email admin at CIT International if you have questions about CIT. Um, I get all those emails as does our executive director, um, and so people send things and we direct them to the people that are most likely to be able to answer questions. Um, so that's another way of getting in touch. Awesome. Well, I personally thank you so much for the decades of work that you're doing. And it does my heart good to know that you find family stories valuable as well. Um, Mimi, Mindy, anything to add other than thank you? I also, <laughs> and I will add my thank you. And Amy, uh, to me, you are you embody the persona and the demeanor that we would all want in a police officer coming to our door. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.